What's up, boss? This is Abraham's wallet. We span the gap between the austerity of obedience to God and the prosperity rising from faithfulness. Run your home and your dough like a biblical boss. Good afternoon, Mark, or morning, depending on when people are consuming this. I have a question for you today as I ashamedly raise up my sweatshirt and ask this question, why aren't the Dallas Mavericks any good at basketball? Well, I can answer that question. It's because they have one good player, and it's pretty rare that we've seen one good player win you a championship or mm. really even get you past the first round of the playoffs. Even the great Akeem Olajuwon <clears throat> enshrined in plastic behind me. Couldn't win a championship no. until they brought him other Hall of Fame players like Clyde Drexler, Houston Zone. Who is a better team right now? No, no qualifications. The Utah Jazz, who were predicted to be in the bottom four teams in the league, but have somehow found themselves atop the West. Or the Dallas Mavericks, who made it to the Western Conference Finals last year. It's the Utah Jazz, but don't come talk to me about teams with uh, good predictions because I'm a, also a Texas Aggie, so I know I know what that feeling is like. Yeah, so you know about talent that doesn't uh, pan out. <laughs> yes. Okay, well, I know that our listeners mostly are not Mavericks aficionados, so we can move on. Um, you know, this week... If you're listening to this, you've clicked the title. You know that we're going to be talking about gambling, and you know that uh, maybe maybe you know this. There's risk. Risk is one of the key subjects that we're going to talk about this week. Sure. I just wanted to get your opinion here in real time about a big gamble or risk that I'm planning to take tonight. Oh, boy. You might tell me, hey, this is an unbiblical gamble that you're about to make. I don't know. You're, you're, you're eating a bean pie for Shabbat, and, you, and you're hoping that it goes well with your lady friend tonight, and then no, you're taking that, a gamble. That's not it. Oh. Um, we've been invited to a, a white elephant party, and I love a white elephant party. Do you, I do, do too. You? Yeah. Yes. It's such an opportunity to think outside the box. Yes, to surprise, even to to disappoint people. It's it's a it's a public platform for delight and and public disappointment. Yeah, and so I will be bringing to this white elephant (laughs) party. um, This came out of a conversation I had with Amelia. We were just sitting on the couch chatting, and I said, "What if I did this?" And she said, "Well, do it." That's what you're going to do. And I said, there's too much risk here. What if what if people hate this and we have to take it home? Okay. That it's worth the risk. You should take this gamble. Yeah. Uh, so I'm thinking 15 to 20 people sitting around in a circle and everybody sees what, you, what was about to be unwrapped with your name on it. Yeah. Okay. Um, and... And I, I am not exactly sure because I have to figure out what what varieties they offer at the store, but some form of gerbil or hamster. Oh my word! In the in the wrapped package in a little gerbil container. What do you think? What are the odds that I have the moral dilemma after this party of either letting it go into the snowy Utah night and knowing that I've killed it, or uh, taking care of it for the next six months until I find a way to poison it. I think there will be a, an uproarious, oh my gosh, we've never seen live animalia at a white elephant party. Yes, you will get that. Do Which, you, that's what I'm going for. Have you already bought it? No. Okay. Here's the number one thought that I have. Well, for, first of all, I think that people at the party, there will be someone at the party who thinks, my kids would love this and I'll take it. Oh, that's my thought. Great. So you will get a great reaction. There will be, 
shock and awe, surprise. Some people will be disgusted that you would do this. And some people will be like, that's awesome. So you're going to get a good reaction. I think One person some coming to the party also owns a boa constrictor. So they might just want it for that. That, Yeah. I mean, it's a gift for the people. Let them do with it what they want um, okay. within the constraints of morality. I would say feeding it to something up the, uh, up the food chain is moral. Okay. Anyhow, um, the thought that I have is even if it were me and between us, I think that my children would be delighted if I surprised them and came home with a hamster, a $12 hamster. But anybody who even says yes to that, they, they're signing on for, they got to get a container. They got to buy that little fluff that you change out. They got to buy food for this thing. So I think if you haven't gotten it yet, you should at least entertain the idea that this will be all that they have for the night. So get them some form of food. Oh yeah. Yeah. I'm planning some, on something to hold it in. I'm planning on a starter kit. I mean, oh. if I have to break the rules and go a little over the $20. Oh, oh. I say you're going to get five stars on this white elephant gift. It's a great idea. Okay, great. Lovely. Now, I want to say this in introduction. This isn't this isn't an introduction to to our subject today. This is still a file under banter. But I would just want to throw out that um, the the giving season is upon us, and I would like to report already. It is it is December second, the day that we record this, and already people are being very generous to Abraham's wallet. God bless them. That's exciting. Um, giving season. A lot of people, a lot of people, I hope, this is what I'm just throwing on to people, that they give throughout the year. They don't wait till the end of the year to find out every dollar that they made, but they give throughout the year. And then when you're able to come down to your accounts at the end of the year, they can kind of calibrate, okay, well, we had more uh, for get more earmarked for giving than we thought. And so we think we can give this last bundle to take us through to the end of the year. <clears throat> and people do giving that way, which and is great. Sometimes Fine. you have to call those charities that you gave to and say, actually, we have less and we're going to need back the amount we gave I've, earlier. I've never done that, but I, that would be horrible. <laughs> um, I just want to throw out this kind of, brag. I like the Christmas season. I like cheers and festivity. And, you know, I just went to the grocery store today and they're selling, you know, cinnamon, I don't know what you'd call them, brand, little pretty branches, decorative branches on the way in and everything's decorated. I love all that. Um, and a brag to the American people. Did you know that Christian philanthropy Believers giving their dough accounted for 70% of all American philanthropy in 2022. And we gave away, Christians gave away the tune of $300 billion. Wow. And the Christians, Christians outgave the U.S. government in addressing global poverty. That's, that's from awesome. That's from Barna. And so I kind of love, I'm throwing a little tinsel at the giving season, celebrating. Giving is a great thing. I assume every family listening uh, does that, and good on you. There. Just want to throw that out. Yeah, that's cool. Um, I, I am not shocked because as much as you hear kind of stats on the low – levels of giving like christians are not tithing their income by 10 percent. yeah and sometimes you hear that like oh these christians they say they give but they don't i guarantee you in my experience as a financial planner families that profess christ tend on average to give a significantly higher chunk of their income to charitable causes than than the average family so absolutely seems like it's true yeah 
Well, it's part of who we are. Our hero gave everything. So that's that our we have a, we serve a generous God and we want to be like him. On the topic of uh gambling, let's Gam- get started. What? <laughs> record scratch? Do you have record scratch? We can come up with something. Okay. Um no, let's get into it for the week. I I'm okay. excited about this topic because this is one of the first times that I've gone to our volley audience, which is kind of the Abe's Wallet Insider crew, yeah, and asked for some input into into the week's topic. And I got a, a couple of responses, but uh, yeah, it, I'm excited about this conversation. Okay, well, we're going to be talking not only about uh, you know, is it okay for a Christian to gamble? That's kind of a uh, angel on the dancing on the head of a pin kind of a question, um, which you could ask anybody you trust about, but we're going to also be talking about what other ways are we gambling, uh, with our finances in ways that isn't necessarily presented as gambling. So I'd, I, the, the obvious question is, I mean, it's just a, it's just a, uh, campfire kind of a question. Um, my father once a week, goes to uh, a a poker game with a bunch of old timers. And I think it's 20 bucks to walk in the door and uh, boy, does he look forward to this game. Um, And that's been a kind of staple for him since army days, I think is finding a place to uh, play poker. Um, And do you think of all of the ways where we, uh, put spare money. I'm going to use that phrase loosely. We put spare money um, in places where something good may or may not happen, but it's to us, it's worth the, worth the trial. You know, you ever been into the front of, I'm going to go way back here, front of a Kmart or some kind of, well, it could be a Chuck E. Cheese for that matter. And you see a little pony and then there's a thing out front that goes stick two quarters in here and you don't know what's going to happen when you stick those two quarters in it could could be like like out of gas and nothing happens or it could be the most fantastic ride for the 5 year old that you've ever seen but you don't know so, so this is this we're talking about young Steven here not adult Steven <laughs> right we're going okay. we're going way back into the 80s here um, because back then you not only were smaller and thus would be reasonably like it could be reasonable for you to sit on that pony ride, but I don't know. Our listeners don't know this if they're younger, but back in the early eighties, when you went into a Kmart, they actually used all of the lights in the building. They turned them all on. So it <laughs> seemed like a normal retail store. Yes. If you go to a Kmart now, they use like 10% of the lights and legitimately it feels like you're, you're in a, a warehouse from some sort of movie. That's there's a well, scene on the box in New if, Jersey. If, if there are Kmarts that it still exist, I haven't been, when a, been in one in decades and it, it would be frightening to me to even hazard that. So, well, I'm telling you, they, they are, on their last gasps in the places <laughs> I've been to a Kmart and they okay. are legitimately saving money by using only one out of 10 fluorescent lights. And it's dark and so it's physically dark inside. Maybe in hot Springs, they might have a Kmart. I think that it would be the type of place where Kmart's still trying <laughs> to eat out their last few dollars. Well, I think this topic is interesting because um, gambling is becoming increasingly common in American society. Um, And I think that if you haven't declared a stance on this for your family, you'll soon need to. Um, Well, let me, let me, let me uh, scrape by a quick overview of, of history. So in, in May of 2018, the Supreme court granted States the power to legalize us sports betting as they see fit. 
So there had been a statute that that only came through federal permission. And in May of 2018, they said, go for it. And 30 states did so. So that, so sports betting is legal in 30 states uh, as of this minute. Um, you consider that ads for sports betting are right now on my favorite sports board podcasts, sports leagues and sports channels are in bed with them. And there's a generation growing up that sees this as commonplace. In Cincinnati, where I live, a big, ugly casino came to downtown Cincinnati almost 10 years ago, and it brought with it, as they all do, increased poverty and divorce rates. And I contend that this trend is part of the coarsening of American culture, where betting on anything, um, even horse races, uh, decades ago was seen as a vice to be kept away from pure eyes. Um, we could talk about the history that, uh, of it where on-track betting was legalized in the 20s and Nevada uh, legalized most forms of betting in 1931 and blah, blah, blah. But we get to the point now where the uh, American Psychiatric Association officially recognized pathological gambling as a mental health disorder in 1980. And the, the 2000s brought us internet gambling. Uh, the internet gambling revenues were $53 billion in 2021, which is more than worldwide movie box office receipts combined. And revenue for internet gambling is up 21% since 2019. So it's on the rise. And I'll give you some stats here. 21% of people diagnosed as having a gambling addiction think, think that gambling is a problem. <laughs> so that is to say 79% of people diagnosed with gambling addiction don't think gambling is a problem for them. 23% of college students report gambling online and 6% do so weekly. Families where a parent gambles compulsively are more likely to experience domestic violence, including child abuse, and children of parents with regular gambling are more likely to develop depression, substance abuse, and behavioral problems later in life. Here's an old quote from 1970. Tom Dewey, the gover governor of New York, said, The entire history of legalized gambling in this country and abroad shows that it has brought nothing but poverty, crime, and corruption, demoralization of moral and ethical standards, and ultimately a lower living standard and misery for all people. So that's where so that's... Yeah. You're sharing all these details. I feel like some of the stuff you're talking about here is going to be detrimental to when we share our affiliate code for FanDuel.com, <laughs> where all of our listeners can get two free weekend big game bets um and your first 50 dollars is free am i and wrong we should have shared those codes before we even started in on all these depressing stats that's a great point that you make and maybe i'll do some little editing magic and and put the code right up top with a little excitement and a little razzle dazzle music okay so it sounds like we have uh, we have been on a fast rolling train towards gambling as a country, and it's it's speeding up as the as the boulder rolls down the hill. That's a fact. Okay. So here's the question: well, we have a Problem with this? If we believe in individual responsibility and everybody can kind of make their own choices, and you know, you're not going to tell me that the Bible has something to say about this, are you? <laughs> Well, um, I'll throw in my two cents on this subject, or, or I'll just represent the, the Bible, uh, if, if that's my role today. Um, the Bible doesn't say, uh, thou shalt not bet on how which uh, dog whip it will run the fastest around a track. It doesn't say that. And that's just for our non-dog racing listeners. A whip it is like a... It's like a budget greyhound, right? Kind of a smaller. Yes, but okay. so that's fast. Like a, that's like a Kmart greyhound. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> uh huh. Um, but it does give us, as it does with all things, it doesn't tell us whether to wear mini skirts 
um, it just gives us principles to live by. So um, the scripture says this. I'll give you a couple of Proverbs. Uh, I, don't, I guess I'll pro- bother with the addresses. Um, wealth gained hastily will dwindle, but whoever gathers little by little will increase it. Now that is just a magic proverb. Wealth gained hastily will dwindle. So if you get a big windfall um, and you went from zero to hero financially overnight, uh, your knees should be knocking and you should go find um, advisors. Um, I, I don't necessarily mean professionals, but yes, professionals too. Go find yourself a team of advisors, of counselors immediately because you are you're on thin ice, biblically speaking. Um, if you don't believe that, go go over to the blog, abrahamswalt.com. Mm. And I wrote a whole article a couple years ago on, uh, I think it was called Inheritance Horror Stories, but we also talked about gambling windfalls. And yes. Actually told the stories of specific people who had come into windfalls of money and what happened in the coming years of their lives. And the spoiler is, it wasn't, uh, they didn't build up multi-generational wealth <laughs> and fund lots of uh, Christ-following grandchildren. That's not no. what they did. No, there, there were a couple of documentaries made. The, the most well-known ones currently were made around 2006, 2010. There's one called um, Millions, and there's one called Lucky. And they're both about lotto winners, just tracking what happened to these people. Let's see some footage of their lives. Guess what? It's not good. Uh, also came to mind, um, there was a 30 for 30 document documentary called Broke. Yeah, that's a good one. Which was about um, pro athletes who one day they're poor and struggling. And the next day, after signing a piece of paper, they're multimillionaires and they don't have the capacity for how to handle this. And guess what? Wealth gained hastily will dwindle. And uh, they, they, many, many, many of them end up broke. So here's the biblical principle is that if you are after a get rich quick concept, which is what you're doing when you pull a gigantic lever on an oversized uh, slot machine, um, that does not turn out good for human beings period. So just repent of anything in you that wants to get rich quick and just go, that's not my destiny. That's not what God wants for me. And I'm going to, I, I'm going to put that away as even a dream or hope in my mind. I'll give you another proverb when now it's talking about money. Proverbs 23, when your eyes light on it, it is gone for suddenly it sprouts wings flying like an eagle toward heaven. And, and people who think easy come, easy go, uh, that's not a good attitude to have about money. Um, it shouldn't be easy come. It, it should come by work and by um, effort and ideas and sweat. Um, and it shouldn't be easy go. I mean, if you lose money honestly because of tragedy, we've talked about how to, how to take a big financial hit. Um, if those things happen, there's ways to walk through those with integrity but uh, money is not easy come, easy go. And uh, this kind of evaporation that money can do, um, it's not the way it's supposed to be, nor is, nor is someone coming into massive amounts of wealth overnight. And here's the kind of general principle for us, and I'll throw it over to you. Ecclesiastes 5 says, He who loves money will not be satisfied with money. It's great insight into human beings. He who loves money will not be satisfied with money, nor he who loves wealth with his income. If you love wealth, you won't be satisfied with whatever you make. And all of this is vanity. And so the idea that I could take a chance, well, one out of a thousand people is going to win. Well, somebody's got to win. So I'll put my money into the hat and I might be one of the one of ones to win. And then I'll just quadruple, quintuple my money. Oh, I'm going to, I'll get rich quick. Don't do that. So getting rich quick is a loser. And the 10th commandment is do not covet. 
don't 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 spend your time rubbing your hands together wishing for something you don't have. Now that's the end of my sermonette. Sorry for getting dour. Now let's get into the fun stuff. What do you have to say about all that? Um, I know that if you've been listening to this podcast for a while, you think that maybe I'm here to provide the the pro gambling position. That's what I'm hoping for. Um, I'm actually not here to argue with anything you said. Uh, before I get into the gambling piece, do you think we could substitute any uh, love of something created in that in that uh, verse you just read? So he who loves, in my personal experience, he who loves bluebell ice cream will never have enough. Like I'll eat until I'm sick uh, <laughs> if I don't moderate my love for the ice cream. I suppose that's true. Yes. Okay. Just curious. Um, yeah. So what I would like to argue, and I, we'll see how this goes, is that there, the gambling, meaning um, putting money on the line in order to uh, try and take a chance at winning a whole lot more money mm. uh, in a game of chance. Um, that's to me pretty unwise in almost every circumstance. Okay. I'm going to argue that there is a difference between variance uh, and participating in activities that have inherent high degrees of variance, but over the long haul actually create wealth. Um, and pure gambling. And so stick with me here because this is going to get very related not only to what you might think of when you think of gambling, but also how we think about investing. Um, as you as you know, I spent a lot of time at poker tables. I'm not a great poker player on the spectrum of, of like the, the great poker players, but I did play quite a bit. And the way I got into it is, you know, some, a coworker of mine was, was talking to me about poker and he said, you, you realize that I could spend a few minutes with you and teach you how to just print money next time you go to a casino and sit down at a poker table with a bunch of junk. Oh, well then. And I thought, well, I'm interested in this. Let's, let's hear more. Um, and it, it turned out to be true. I, Took my, I remember very clearly taking a hundred dollars, which felt like so much money to me. Sure. Um, and kind of quivering as I handed it to the to the person. I'm sure whatever I did was not the cool way to buy into the, to the game. As <laughs> very yes. self, very self conscious. Not I'm, the insider. Wink, wink. I'm thinking everybody here knows that I'm going to be terrible, but I've. I've done my homework. I've read this book that was recommended to me. Uh, and I know that there's some things that most players at a casino are going to do that I can take advantage of. And I just need to be patient. Um, so I think I left that, that day with like $170 and I thought it's magical and it works. <laughs> uh, and, you know, from there I, I started really putting some time into the game and this is where I, I do think you've heard me say it, but poker and craps are totally different animals in that you can get good at poker. Um, there's absolutely an element of chance and variance to it, but there is a reason to uh, quote the great movie rounders that the same, you know, handful of people end up at the final table at the World Series of Poker half the time. Right. Because you can get good at this game. And the skills involved are being able to calculate variant uh, probabilities very quickly. Um, and we can talk as much as you want to about the nerdy stuff. But um, the higher up you go in the skill levels, the the more people are using really, really complicated strategies. So you want to play at the high level you better have a uh, john nash from princeton level of kind of understanding of game theory mechanics and kind of advanced math um but you can you can learn a few tricks and say well if i just do these things 
kind of automatically, you don't have to look people and see if they're twitching and try to make a bluff and none of that. You can just use a little simple math and you're probably going to win uh, most of the time. Although sometimes you will walk away losing because there's still an element of chance in the near term. So that was poker. And what I learned that helped me kind of have a lot of success there was, A, this is a game of variance, meaning there's really a couple of things that you have to know to be successful in it. One of them is you can't take more risk than you have in reserves. So like I said, I bought in for $100. And I think when I started out in that journey, I had take, I'd saved up $500. Um, well, when I sat down at the table, they said you can buy in for $300. As little as $100, as much as $300. But variance says even if you do everything right, you could easily end up in a situation where you've got all $100 in the middle and you have a 90% chance of winning and the 10% comes out and you lose. Uh, if, if you put all your money in, now you're done. You go home. You've lost all your money. Um, but you have to match the level of risk that you're willing to take with any given action that you take in that game to the level of reserves that you have so that you can play long enough to realize the average rate of return over time, which usually takes lots of years um, in a game like that. Uh, is there a game, is poker, is it possible to have um, a positive rate of return over time? Oh, absolutely. Everybody that's, that's good at poker should have a positive rate of return over time. Um, and the reason being, unlike almost any other activity in a casino, you're playing people and the casino, if you're playing at a casino, is taking their they're taking their chunk out of the pot yes and they don't care who wins um so that's that's kind of my argument for why uh poker is a little bit of a different beast than How about volley. blackjack right and we had a lot of people on the volley channel write in and say well i i don't think i'm a gambler but i do like to do what your dad does steven and go play cards go play poker with the guys um once a week or whatever um I think the interesting thing from my story, just to put a bow on it, is variance can go two ways. You can experience the the downside of variance. So when I would play, I had an app and I would track, here's how long I played, here's how much I bought in for, here's how many hands I played, and here's what I took out at the end of the day. And after years of doing this, I could tell you very precisely what my hourly return was, Mm -hmm. even though... In an individual hour, there were times when I made several thousand dollars. And there were times when I lost quite a lot of money. What um, was it? Do you remember? It wasn't nearly as high as you think. I think I uh, it was at like $23 an hour. Okay. Um, and and so the I was tracking that so I would know, hey, if you're losing, then don't play. Like You're doing something wrong. You're playing people that are better than you. You need to go find a game that's easier, whatever. Um, but I, what I did is I looked in after I'd been doing this for a few years, I got up to a point where I was playing some sort of for the layperson high stakes games for, for a poker professional, they would not feel high stakes, but, um, and I looked at my rate of return and I went back to this poker kid who had taught me what I knew and I showed him and he said, this is insane. You're not as good as how much money you've won in the past year. Mm. And so I said, I am experiencing not the downside of variance where you lose more than you should, but the upside where I was like tens of thousands of dollars ahead of where I should be based on my skill level. Then you walk away, right? I did. Uh, We paid off med school loans and now I play for for fun and I don't don't play high stakes games at all anymore. that's all to say I'm not interested in gambling personally. I don't really get a thrill out of it. Um, I liked the challenge of the math problems and kind of just personal challenge. But I, you just asked about blackjack. I don't like to sit down at a blackjack table one little bit because for sure, if you sit there long enough, you lose your money. Mm. Um, barring being a part of a, cou- a card counting team or stuff that you may have heard about, like that's a real thing. But 
craps, the casino has an advantage. You stay long enough, you play 10 million hands, or whatever they're called, of craps. I've never played one dice roll of craps in my yeah. life. I don't know how it works. But um, you do that long enough, you will lose your money. Right. I think the, the advantages are also very small by design. I think that the casino's advantage in these games is usually between 1% and 3%. So um, it's designed that way so you don't just throw up your hands and walk away, but you you, you win some big hands here and there, and you go, Get well, that taste. Great. Get that taste. Um, so all of the, the pure gambling stuff is designed to make you stick around and get it get a taste of what it's like to, to, to win. Uh, this is to me why golf is so addictive as well is because even though I'm not very good once in a while, I'll hit a tiger woods shot and end up six inches from the hole from 150 yards out and think that's who I really am. Like I just need to be consistent. <laughs> um, I'll be back pursuing that shot again. Exactly. Um, and gambling uses all sorts of psychological tools to convince you that that's the norm. And then when you lost, it was bad luck. And mm. sort of, you were on that downside variance uh, that I talked about. Um, and it's very true that some people are hardwired to be very, uh, they're, they're comfortable with taking huge risks. And some people, they are, are maybe a little more like me where they experience that. I remember I have played blackjack and I, I was waiting for a table to be available at a restaurant. And there was a blackjack table outside the restaurant in, in Las Vegas. And I, my buddy said, let's, let's do it. And so I bought in, I think I bought in for $50 and I got down to $30 cause you were playing $10 hands of blackjack. And I thought I'm going to be so angry if I lose this money. Like I'm not having fun. I don't enjoy this. There's not, <coughs> and so I don't get a thrill out of the the thing. I got back up to my fifty dollars, and I said, "Give me my chips. I'm leaving. <laughs> um, not interested." But some people, they're not going to have that reaction. Um, yeah. And going back to what some of our listeners said, uh, you know, there's a lot of stories of somebody who gets a, a little taste of gambling, and probably. Uh, a lot of those stories start with, I had a great night on my first outing. Oh, I yeah. experienced that upside variance. Um, and like looking at my own story, I think it would have been very easy to say, hey, I'm the next Phil Hellmuth. I'm killing it and I just need to go bigger. And yep. the math told me you would lose all your money and then some if you did that. Uh, yeah. You, you know, um, so... I believe that most of what you read in the Bible to kind of come back around is talking about this instinct that all humans have to some degree to say, is there a shortcut uh, to, to wealth? And um, might I be able to kind of game the system and get, get some, uh, get some money into my hands that I didn't have to earn the, the biblical way, which is slow generally through toil and, patience and wisdom. Uh, and if so, let's, let's go. Um, I want to, I want to pick back up on exactly what you're saying right now. We'll come right back to this moment, right after I take a little detour and just finish off the, the idea of gambling and casinos. And I just want to say, I don't, and I don't think we stand on a place where we think that, uh, I've gone to, uh, I don't know what these places are in Las Vegas, but uh, one time when Jeff and I were young men, we had no money and we we just wanted to see what is Las Vegas. And we went there and we put $5 into nickel slots. I don't think putting a coin into a slot machine and pulling the lever is sinful in itself. I don't think that darkening the doors of a casino is sinful. I think the whole industry is gross. I wish it didn't exist. Um, it has brought nothing but uh, pain, um, generally speaking, to people. But I, I don't want to sound like uh, you know uh, um, a moralizer that says that you know my dad can't buy in for twenty dollars. What my dad is doing, uh, forgive me for justifying what my dad's doing, um, but 
what he's doing is he's buying an evening with his friends for 20 bucks. And they think it would be more fun to play for small stakes than to play for nothing. And, and just like you say, what are there five guys that come and every, probably about every fifth time my dad walks away with the wad of cash and guess what? He brings it right back to that group, um, over and over. So it's not like he's uh, putting himself in jeopardy, hurting the family, whatever, in the same way that you think, well, the pony ride in front of the Kmart is worth 25 cents to ha- give my kid 90 seconds of, of fun. It's also worth 20 bucks for an evening of fun for my dad. He's paying for a game. So is it, is it gambling to go into a bowling alley and pay $12 for a, a, a round of bowling? No, it's not immoral. And if you understand, well, I'm paying for the fun for 30 minutes, an hour, whatever, fine. Um, but it's the, as you say, now I'm going to come back to the get well, rich quick thing. Yeah. We got to think about the pony ride like a poker player. It's worth 25 cents. The the thing costs 10 cents to make it go back and forth. Yes. And you have a 50% chance that it will work. So should you do it? <laughs> That's right. Well, the yeah, and there's, yes. that's a plus <laughs> EV move. There's, and there's a chance that to, even if it works, you know, if it does what it's designed to do, it won't be fun. I mean, I have you ever, to me, the th- most thrilling thing that I ever came across at Chuck E. Cheese as a kid was you get in this thing that's shaped like a big plastic helicopter and it raises three feet off the ground. And I thought this is totally amazing. I'm basically in a low grade helicopter and that's all it did. And then went back down. Um, okay. Back to the, back to the point that you were on, which is the problem is when the Bible talks about, uh, just having this desire to do a shortcut. Now, my question to you, Mr. Financial planner is, how do people do this who don't call themselves gamblers, but they actually do gamble with their finances? Yeah. So when you think about the stock market, let's just simplify and think about the stock market as one thing. All right. And say, it, you know, over time, the stock market has returned about 10%, but there's good reason to believe that 8% is a fair number for what it would return going forward. Yeah. Um, so let's just say that it returns 8%. A lot of people will look at the stock market and say, I would like to buy a house two years from now. Um, I have $50,000 or $100,000 and I'm going to need it in two years. But if I put it into a high yield savings account, I will make 3%. If I put it into the stock market, History says I'm going to make 8% a year. And what they don't understand is the same thing that a a poker player who doesn't go broke has to understand, which is that there's a lot of variance between point A and point B. And you have to manage, you know, in poker, we call it your bankroll. That's how much money you've got dedicated to poker that you can keep pulling $100 bills out and buying back into the game if you lose. Um, And... There's, there's math formulas to tell you if your bankroll is this much, you should play games that are this size. Um, mm. And it's the same with investing. You need to have an appropriate amount of time in the market to weather the ups and downs because next year in, in my house down payment scenario could be one of those years where we see a 40% drop. Um, and, you know, if you're in for the next 10 years, I tell people, no sweat. We're still going to see that 8% average yep. out um, because we're going to have years like we had a couple of years ago where there's a 40 or 50% up um, and they're going to average out. Trump years, but, as I recall. There's variance. And so gambling is ignoring the concept of, hey, I just need to be diligent over time, which is actually something the Bible would endorse. Um, and I don't know, maybe it's a spicy opinion, but I would say that a principle could apply to something like poker as well as it could apply to investing. But um, if I if I am diligent over time and thinking clearly about what I'm putting into the market um, so that I don't lose any sleep when it goes 
plummeting uh, because of some news because I know, well, that we expected that. Um, and over time, I'm going to get my 8%. Um, no problem there. Where we are gambling is when we say either, hey, I know 8% is the, the whole stock market, but I remember some stories about people buying Apple stock in 2002, and they went up 1,300% in a few years. Yep. Um, I'd like to do that. Let's pick one of the thousands of companies that, that you can invest in, and I'm just going to put it all on black and go with that. Uh, that would be pure gambling. You're, Great you're assuming point. either you you know you're gambling and you say, hey, uh, I don't know anything about it, but some of these companies have got a pop. Um, or uh, you think you know things about that company that that you probably don't, unless you're an insider to the company and then you're breaking the law in a different way. But um, for the most part, you don't know, you don't have a hot take on a stock that uh, you're going to outsmart all the institutional investors in the world. Yes. Um, and you might, you might hit on that option that goes up by 1300%. Uh, but my contention is that that will be luck. And when we're doing that, we are purely in the realm of gambling. Just like, you know, there's decisions within the game of poker where, I'm at a 50-50 and I can decide to let off the gas pedal and just let this hand play out. Or I can say, hey, it's a toss up. Let's push it all in the middle and see what happens. Um, the reason that I was never better than I was is because I didn't have that gear in my body that mm. said that would be fun to risk everything right here on a coin toss. Um, believe it or not, most of the people at the highest end of the poker world are people who they absolutely love the gambling as well as being really good at the math. But right. what, what I think is interesting is those names who continually show up at the final tables of the World Series of Poker and they're famous for poker, um, they're great players, no doubt, but almost all of them have gone bankrupt like over and over and over because part of their DNA is when I get money, I think the best thing I could do do it again. Shove it in and risk it. So this is why when we're talking to somebody about their uh, their investments, we always talk about what's your personal risk tolerance and how long are you going to be able to stay in the market? Right. Because no matter what someone says, oh, yeah, yeah, I know, over a long time. Uh, if they don't know their own hearts and can look at, let's say they put $1,000 into the stock market and check it out in 12 months and it's $600. You know what they could do to completely not ever see that, that average rate of return is say, this is terrible. Sell everything. I'm going back to cash. Well, now we've locked in a 40% loss. Right. Um, so I would say with investing, you are gambling if you are not um, putting your money in for the appropriate amount of time based on the investment you're making. So it's not gambling to put money that you're going to need next month into a savings account and earn a small return on it. Um, it's not gambling to put money that you won't need for 20 years in your 401k into very risky investments because we know over time those tend to have the best rate of return because there's going to be some really big wins and some big losses. Well, when um, you say risky, you, you mean a, a risky uh, category of investments. You don't mean a risky company. That's right. Um, even individual companies, we've talked about this a bunch, but venture capital firms, they invest directly in brand new startups generally, and they plan their investments such that they say, we need to be able to make 10 similarly sized investments knowing that seven will be worthless um, after a period of time three are going to return money to us and only one of those three is going to be a winner, a real home run. And it will give us a 10 X to, or 10 to a 50 X return. Yeah. Um, and that's how we make all our money. So if you have, if you're a venture capitalist and you only had enough money to make one bet, well, the odds are dramatically high that you will have $0 left. Right. 70% right. of your investments go to zero. Right. Um, 
And the event horizon that they're interested in is much longer than we tend to think of. When you keep talking about the, the market going down, I think of 2020 to 21, everything went down, down, down. And people that understood the event horizon, they rolled with it. To go like, well, that's fine. And then there were also people that get that got very upset going, what's happening in the short term? And a lot of times what, what we're ending up doing with those people is just comforting them with, okay, over time, the stock market goes up and down. Over time, it rises uh, uh, predictably, um, which brings up the other kind of gambling, which is you mentioned somebody who's looking for the next Apple. And so they go all in on, so this is the great idea. I remember when I was a mortgage broker, um, a dude was running around the office talking about, I'm telling you, this company has cracked the code on cancer. And this company has the technology that is just going to be the technology everybody's going to be in on cancer. You got to buy this company. And so what did we all do? We all ran out and put various amounts of money on this one stock and it's worthless now. But that's that's a, that's the kind of gambling you're talking about. The other kind of gambling. It's worthless after they cured cancer? It didn't quite cure cancer. I think we, oh. we probably would have heard of it. Okay. Um um, the other kind of gambling is the general gambling of the stock market is, is going down. I'll take all of my money out of the stock market. And then me with my magical Gandalf senses, I'll know when we've reached the bottom and that starts going up in a way that's going to continually go up. That's when I'll buy in and I'll always sell high and I'll always buy low. And that's because I'm a genius. That is also gambling. And it's this, these are two fantastic recipes for uh, hamstringing multi-generational wealth is trying to play both of these stupid games. That's right. So I would say you can gamble in the stock market just as surely as gambling happens at the craps table or the roulette wheel. Yep. Um, you can gamble. I mean, I, I'm not trying to make this a poker podcast, but if you put me against the number one best poker player in the world and you said you guys are going to play one hand for a million dollars, I've got a great chance of winning. Great chance. If you said you're going to take a humongous stack of chips and play nonstop until one person has all the money, I probably have almost a zero chance. Of <laughs> yeah. Um, but I think that there's some clear gambling. There's some clear not gambling. Uh, investing in a volatile asset that over time, whether that's the stock market, whether that's real estate assets, those are going up and down like crazy right now. But making a decision that says I have a very long time horizon, I can put money into something. Um, that to me is squarely not gambling. The Bible almost, it, it doesn't just not, it tells us not to do that. It's, it tells us we must uh, show a return on, on resources that we hold. And that involves investing, which involves some risk. But uh, then there's some stuff in the middle, Stephen. And I think one of the things that you talked about in your review was that sports betting is becoming kind of a ubiquitous in the US. It's certainly, Yep. Uh, I looked up a map of where sports betting is legal and it's only not legal in six states in, hmm. in the US right now. One of them happens to be the one that I live in. So I don't see the TV commercials hmm. the way that uh, most of you do. But um, I know that there's people who have made their living at sports betting. Um, I'm not a sports better. It does it. The only time I've bet on sports is if uh, I was so emotionally tied to a game that I said it would be worth flushing $10 down the toilet to uh, bet against my team so that when they lose, I'll feel at least <laughs> a little bit better. Um, That's but funny. It's always, it's always been a bet that I said, I hope I lose this because I am really going for my sure. team. Sure. Um, I don't think that's probably the norm uh, in sports betting, but um, what do we think about things like that where there seem to be people who do research and have edges, but 
in some ways, it's not that different from active management or day trading stocks or some of the things where I would say it's unwise, but some people seem to be showing returns over long periods of time. Gosh, my 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 feeling would be um, um, very uh, cautious. I would I would tread lightly on all of that stuff. It, to me, I mean the way that sports uh, betting is priced. Um, the people who set the pricing for sports betting, they, they know how human beings work. And it's the same, it's the same as the casino industry. They know that they will end up on the winning side over time. And so I have dipped my toe into the waters of sports betting because I just assume that I know more about NBA basketball than most of these yokels that are betting money. And I found out in a short amount of time, <laughs> no, I don't. Um, there, there's crazy variants. It's just like we, what we just said at just the top of the hour. If, if we had put money down on what would the Mavericks record be right at, at 20 games into the season, we'd have lost all of our money. It would seem like such a safe bet. Well, we'd have a winning record at least. At, at least we'd have a winning record. No, they didn't. Um, and... Uh, I, I think those things are really, when I hear that a dude is a day trader and he goes, well, I've been doing it for 18 months and uh, been doing all right. I, I pat him on the back and think, I hope you can come up with a legitimate career at some point. I think, I hope you can do something that is, um, gives you good income, doesn't let, make you live life on a razor's edge. Um, and it and isn't some form of as you say we're 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 betting on on percentages, uh, and it is not it's not a good deal. Yeah, I I've had that same experience with sports. I just thought I watch a lot of basketball, and <laughs> what if I just tried this out? And I remember I was at a casino, and I thought, well, I'm not going to put any money down because I've never done this, but I'm going to take one of these cards these bet cards and I'm going to fill out what I would bet on if I was going to spend a hundred dollars. Oh yeah. I've done that. I've done that. I lost like 90% of the things I got wrong. And that's I just right. Thought, that's like when you take the SAT and realize you would have done better by choosing C on every answer. Yeah, like, that's right. My edge is actually to choose the exact opposite. of. Yes. Them. I've been to sports books before where you, you have that little parlay card and you go, well, what let's say I, picked four of the most obvious games, the NFL games on a weekend and go, look, I know what the winners of these four games are going to be. Just pick those four. Look at the parlay. Wow. It'd be good return. I'm not putting any extra money. I'm just going to see what happens every time. I, I've never, I've never won one of those because there's always some kind of upset. Man. Yeah. And that, uh, I, I think that that's the same kind of, error that people make on on the investing front is we've we may have even talked about this did you know there's whole mutual funds that are built on they take the because there's there's tracking metrics that look at what retail investors do with their stock investing okay. dollars uh, they can see what percentage of flows in and out of each security come from retail investors which is you and me mm. um, versus institutional investors, which is things like the Texas Teachers Retirement Fund and these mm. huge multi-billion dollar funds that are putting huge amounts of money into to individual stocks. And the answer <laughs> is that these mutual funds that say, let's take exactly what retail investors are doing in the stock market, and our mutual fund will do the exact opposite. Wow. Like one for one of those moves. And those funds tend to make money. Um, and the, the reason is, I mean, the same reason we could do this all day. We could talk about crypto. Uh, if you followed the flow of crypto, once it became hyped and popular and people said, let's get all our money in crypto by then you were too late to the party and you're going to lose money if you just kind of follow the, the yeah. trends. So, um, yeah, I, I think that we've made the case, at least the, this gambling instinct of, I want to jump in on something to, to get a quick return, generally rooted in the sinful human heart. Yes. 
there's a couple other little things I wanted to, to mention. Okay. Um, I do think your comment about casinos, gambling often happens in places where lots of other vices are going to be shoved in your face. Yes. That's true in the investment world too. Uh, mm. You go, go hang out with some, some uh, hedge fund managers in New York city and uh, the, the wolf of wall street is not too far from reality in terms of the sin that tends to accompany high risk, uh, placing a lot of bets all the time lifestyles. Um, but whether it's that uh, or it's just simply there's a lot of, of brokenness around me. If I if you go walk into your average casino in Cincinnati, Ohio, I guarantee you they may not have girls dancing and stuff like that, but there's going to be stuff on display that makes you go, this is really not God's intention for yeah. uh, humanity. Um, and then I know there's – when we talk about any addiction, if we talked about alcohol, if we talked about pornography, if we talked about gambling, these things that are very prevalent in our society and they get their hooks into people, our audience is large enough that there are people listening to this one, just like if we talked about any other addiction, that are going to go, yeah, I agree, and that's me. Like, mm-hmm. I am stuck in this one. Mm-hmm. Um, and... You know, on the Volley Channel, one of our listeners talked about having a father who got addicted to gambling and was was living in Reno and making good money, working actually at a casino. Um, and he said, my dad, in some sort of like desperation, Hail Mary, just up and moved to another state uh, and got himself completely out of that environment and looks back and, you know many, many years later said that was the most foolish time of my mm. life. And thank, thank God I was able to get out of the, the kind of environment where I would never have escaped that. Uh, and this guy kind of uh, has connected with friends of his, his father and said a lot of them are still involved in all these vices and still, still doing the gambling. But sometimes you actually have to take drastic action to unplug if you're yes. hearing any of this and going, you know, I can't help myself. I hear of a stock tip and I go say, what if this is the one? And I'm always putting 500 bucks into the next big thing and I can't really afford it. Um, or, you know, whatever it looks like, if it's the casinos or if it's sports betting, you might need to take drastic action to make that not possible for you. Yes. That could mean getting rid of a smartphone, uh, which yes. it seems like, a fair chunk of the addiction that happens uh, in our society comes from constant access to everything on the True. internet. True. But, um, you know, I wish it was as, as easy as moving away from Reno now, but unfortunately your smartphone's going to let you gamble wherever you are uh, pretty much, unless you want to come to Utah, in which case I would be happy to show you around. Um, nice. But, uh, that's that's one thing. I actually think that if you're hearing this and you're going, I, I just I have a gambling issue. Um, there's a national helpline that you can call, and they will do things for you at that number. The do you know about this, Stephen? No. Um, if you call one eight hundred five two two forty seven hundred, you can put yourself on the blacklist at casinos where when you try to. Uh, go and get out money and they ask for your ID. They look at it, they put your name in the computer and they say, you don't get to play here. That's kind of neat. So if I had a gambling thing and I said, man, this is really not good. I would, I would X myself out of uh, that, that world. Now, will it just like anything, would it be impossible for you to gamble? No, of course not. You're right. Uh, But put up some barriers in your life and um, call that number get yourself some resources. I I think certainly this is the type of thing, you know, that bringing it into the light as with any addiction is critical and saying to a group of men, I uh, have been gambling and you guys may not have ever known this about me, but yeah, do that. Like get it in the light. Um, I really hope that, that you've, you've got somebody in your life that's not going to look at you and 
you'd be shocked and think what a terrible person mm. but they can actually go huh well i never knew that but let's let's partner up and stop sort of stop that behavior from wreaking havoc in your life anymore. yeah i'll just say on that point that i've had many men confess many things to me and there's always a half second of disappointment oh i didn't know that you did that and then that is immediately followed by boy do i esteem you having the courage to talk about this man was this a smart move for you um that personally, I just end up honoring men who have the courage to to make that move. So, for whatever that's worth, a high integrity man will would would honor you um, taking the risk of vulnerability. So, yes, I was going to take us to the close with yes. a couple of admonitions. But um, if if the last thing, if you're hearing this and you have conflicting opinions, or you're a day trader, or you're a professional craps player and you want to tell us what, what a bunch of chuckleheads we are. Um, we had a really cool conversation even just yesterday on the volley channel uh, with some readers kicking around ideas about some of the things we talked about when it comes to discipling your children. Yes. And I wouldn't say it got heated, but I would say there was differing opinions that it was fun to, to hear people kind of talk through. Um, that volley space is a really good resource if you don't have people that want to talk about this type of stuff in your community, or even if you do and you want some more. Um, so check that out. You can you can get invited to the volley if you go to abrahamswallet.com slash donate. That's a supporter, a supporter network that you if you if you can buy us a cup of coffee a, a month, then we would love to have you in the volley channel. I, I said that wrong. We're not going to use it for coffee. We're going to use it for the spread of Abraham. True, Walter. that's right. We're not going to use it for coffee. Of the coffee. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, and what was the other thing I was going to say, Steve? Um, I don't know, but I'll buy you time by repeating what to me is the mantra of this episode. Wealth gained hastily will dwindle, but whoever gathers little by little will increase it. And one thing that we stand for at Abraham's Wallet is that if you read the Bible, God is pro-prosperity and even, don't tell anybody, just between us, pro-wealth. And so we want to uh, help you be wise in the decisions that you make, avoiding the pitfalls of finance. And one of the pitfalls of finance is the desire to get rich quick. It's not good for you. And uh, that's that's why we think gambling is something to avert. Well, I'm in full agreement. I don't have anything else to add there. I also, I have to get out and find a good gerbil that's going (laughs) to sit quietly in the package before he gets unwrapped. So, well, you know what, if if it does scratch around and make some noise, the anticipation will be off the charts. It's going to go good either way. You're right. (laughs) Uh, I think we'll have something to report next time. Okay. Enjoy white elephanting. Shabbat Shalom. All right, see you next week.